12, and I'm going to read uh, verses 18 through 27, but we're going to actually survey those first 27 verses because I believe that is one thought unit, Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 27. But I'll read 18 through 27. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him. And they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died, and he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise, so the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You, therefore, are greatly mistaken. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his written word. May be sanctified in our hearts. Let's bow together for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word once again. We pray that you would open it to us, that we might see Jesus in all of his majesty, splendor, and might, and that seeing him, Lord, we'd be drawn to him and drawn to be more like him. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk this morning just for a few moments from this subject of Jesus exercises his authority. Jesus exercises his authority. I think one of the more profound illustrations of authority is in the sporting world and it's also in the law enforcement world. But the sporting world one I think kind of conveys a more definitive uh, example. You be watching a football game for example, at any given time there are 22 players on the field, 11 on either side. And some of these guys are 350, 360, 370 pounds, and some even larger. And they go at a pace that is un unbelievable how big they are, how fast they are, and how hard they can hit. And they're literally trying to rip each other's heads off to tear each other to shreds once the play is executed. And then these five or six guys out there running around with knickers and, you know, striped shirts, will blow the whistle and they will stop. All the action stops. Now the football players, they've got power. They have energy. They have conditioned themselves to be world class. They are sort of a cut above the average human being because they have been training and lifting weights and doing all of these special exercises basically to bring their bodies to peak performance so that they can perform at this elite level. It has been said that the amateur athlete and the professional athlete is different in this regard. The amateur athlete practices to try to get it right. The professional athlete has reached a point where he's practiced so much that he will seldom get it wrong. But these huge, hulking athletes understand on the field who has the authority. They have the power, but the referees have the authority. With the blow of the whistle, they stock the competition. They can take that rag out of their pocket and they can throw it at you when you commit an infraction, and they can penalize you. If they don't like your conduct, they can eject you from the game because they have the authority to do that that has been invested in them by the owners of the National Football League they have the authority. There's a difference between power 
and authority. Power is the ability to do something. Authority is the authority, the right to do what you do and have the backing of somebody else behind you. The same is the case in law enforcement. In the city of Charleston, I think that we have about 185 police officers, give or take a few. And there are over 52,000 residents that live in Charleston. But the 182, they have authority that has been invested in them by the mayor and the city council of the city of Charleston that is recognized by the state of West Virginia and it also has the endorsement of the United States government. And so they can stop you anytime they want to stop you. If you drive too fast, they can write you a ticket. And if you buck up to them, I don't care how large you are, they can take their stick and they can hit you upside the head. And if necessary, they can pull out a high-powered weapon and use the force that they believe necessary at that moment to subdue you because they have the authority to do it. The authority to do it. And so we've got to understand this word authority. It is a very, very important word to the New Testament church that we take very lightly. In Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission, Jesus says that all authority has been given to me. He claimed to have all authority in heaven and on the earth. And then what he does is he then delegates that authority to his disciples. So we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been deputized by the big man, by the sheriff of the universe, Jesus Christ, we have been deputized with his authority to exercise his agenda on the earth in his absence. And so the authority that he's been given to us is the authority to try to move his kingdom and to move his agenda by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, by loving people, serving people, and caring for people, to bring to bear in real time and space the principles of God's kingdom to give those who believe the opportunity to trust Jesus Christ and to be saved and to come under God's authority and then to have God's power in their lives and to also have their place reserved in God's eternal kingdom. The conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day, it was a conflict about authority. Who has the right for authority to teach with authority to be heard and to move the masses of the people? So by the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, the Jewish nation as it was in the Old Testament is no more. There is no Jewish nation by the time of Jesus' birth in his ministry on the earth. As a matter of fact, there hadn't been a Jewish nation since 586 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar came in from the north, leveled Jerusalem, and took back the fairest and the brightest to be uh, slaves in his camp, brought the nation of Israel under the authority of the Babylonian Empire. And they'd been under Babylon's authority, they'd been under Medo-Persian authority, they'd been under Greco authority, now they were under the Roman authority. They were just an occupied territory with no national autonomy or independence. But the religious leaders basically had been delegated certain authority by the Roman government to keep the people in line, and the Roman government allowed them to use their religion as a way of keeping people in line as long as people paid their taxes, and as long as there was not an insurrection to overthrow the government. If there was an insurrection, then Rome would come in with their soldiers and they would crush it. If the people failed to pay their taxes, there would be a strict penalty that one would pay. And so Rome had a very sophisticated system of collecting taxes. That would be the envy of the United States Internal Revenue Service today. Rome's system was so effective that they, they were able to exact a surplus of money from the people and was able to hire local people and to have them to be paid in the excess, excess that they were able to collect from the people. You paid your taxes, you acknowledge the authority of Caesar and the Roman government, and Rome pretty much let you do what you wanted to do. So then Jesus comes on the scene, and he's kind of 
disturbing this apricot. He, he's, he's creating some problems because he's working and operating on the outside of the authority of the Jewish religion, the authority of Judaism, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, the 71 men that were responsible for leading the Jewish people, for managing the Jewish worship system, and so forth. He was working on the outside of that, and he had amazed a tremendous following behind him that were loyal to him and that were sort of gravitating, moving away from the Jewish leaders and gravitating to Jesus. And so that's where we are by the time we come to chapter 12 of Mark. And by this time, the religious leaders have already decided he has to go, and they don't mean just to be run out of town. He has to be eliminated. He has to die. They're just waiting for the right time, the right place, and the right circumstance to basically to exercise this, this hit upon him. So in these last two chapters of Mark, there's a lot of confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders because this is their the last opportunity to recognize him as their long-awaited Messiah, to yield to his teachings, to believe the gospel, and have themselves to be saved. So in chapter 11, you come to the end of the chapter in verse 27 through verse 33, there was this whole question about authority. The religious leaders come to Jesus. He was walking to the temple, temple, and they say to him, by what authority do you do this? This was troubling them. They knew that they had not delegated him the authority as the religious leaders. They had not delegated him authority as quasi-political leaders. They knew that Rome would never, baptize, never bypass them and give authority to some itinerant, carpenter, uneducated, uncouth, unlearned preacher from Nazareth of Galilee with a band of uncouth, unsophisticated disciples following him. And so they said, figure, how does he have the authority to do this? So they said to him, by what authority are you doing this? That's the issue. What legal right do you have to do what you are doing? And so in that context, Jesus responds to them simply, with another question. He says, all right, the baptism of John. The baptism of John. He says, was this of God or was it of men? Because John had a huge following. John's following was outside of Judaism. It was outside of the Roman government. A lot of people followed John, and John had pointed them to now follow Jesus. The people revered John as a great prophet, a man of God. Some thought he may have been the Messiah. Some thought he was Elijah. And so Jesus says, John's baptism, where did it come from? Did it come from God or did it come from men? They knew they were in a hot spot, that they were about to incriminate themselves. Because if they say where well, it came from God, then the obvious question is, then why didn't you follow John? Why didn't you heed John's words? Why didn't you repent? John called you white washed sepulchers. John said, y'all were a bunch of dead man's bones. John says y'all were an irrelevant relic of Judaism and you guys did not repent and believe John. And on top of that, you remained silent. When Herod put him in prison, you could have broken a deal and got John out of prison. But instead, you remained silent and you allowed Herodias, Herod's adulterous wife, to have John's head cut off. They were in a tough spot. If they say it was of God, he say, well, why didn't you believe John and why didn't you defend John? And if they said, well, it wasn't of God, then the people would have been upset. And so they basically, the, being the religious hypocrites that they are, they say, we don't know. <laughs> and so then Jesus responds, well, neither will I tell you by what authority did I do these things. <laughs> I remember this little skirmish that my younger sister and I had once. And, you know, I was always, I'm the big brother, so I'm going to, Lord over her, my authority of being a year and 11 months older than what she is, and I'm going to interrogate her about where she's been and who she's with and what time she's supposed to be coming back home. And so she came in one day, and I started asking all these litany of questions, and finally she stopped me right in the middle of the sentence. And she said, you ain't my daddy, and you ain't my boss, and I ain't got to ask none of your questions. <laughs> and so she let me know in no uncertain terms. But I continued to do that. As a matter of fact, I will do it to this day. I was up with them last week, and I said, look, you've got to help your husband now. You, you, you're traveling too much. You're on the road too much. You're singing too much. My brother-in-law just took a church, pastor church. I said, you've got to stay in Champagne now and help him. And she said, you're right. 
Now, it took us 57 years to get there, see? But we, now we, we're there, and she now is recognizing me as the patriarch of this wonderful family that we have. And so the idea is all about who, who has the authority. So now we set this scene that this confrontation is over authority. They recognize he's operating as one with authority. He's not acting for permission. He's not seeking their advice. He is acting. The people are following him, and now they see that their base is being eroded as people defect to follow Jesus. And then Jesus tells them this parable. You need to read this in your leisure. In Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, this is a scathing indictment against them and so now Jesus has now gone public it's no behind the scene conversations these major conversations now being having and had with them in public because he's exposing their hypocrisy to the people so he tells them this parable about this man who planted a vineyard he put a hedge of protection around the vineyard he dug a place for a wine vat he built a tower inside of the vineyard. He leased, the vine, leased out the vine dresses, and he went into the far country. Now, this illustration really was of the nation of Jerusalem, that God had established a nation, Israel. He had created a capital, Jerusalem. He put them up on a hill. He then goes into the far country. God, in terms of being absent in terms of the Messiah, he leases it out to the Jewish people. And in particular, the religious leaders have the custodial responsibility for the nation. God expects for them to cultivate the nation. God expects for them to bring forth a spiritual harvest to the glory of God while God is in the far country until his return. He says, so what does the, what does the owner do? Well, the owner, he sent some of his servants to them in verse 3, and they beat the servants, and they sent them away empty-handed. The servants came on behalf of the owner, and they came expecting to receive some type of harvest, some type of fruit from the vineyard. Instead, they beat them and sent them away empty-handed. He sent some other servants. They threw stones at them. They wounded them in the head. That indicates they were intending to try to kill them, and they sent them away shamefully. And then he sent another, some other servants, and many of them they beat, and some they killed, and then finally, he sent them his son, expecting they would say, this is the heir, this is the beloved one of the owner, we will receive him and respect him. He says that those vine dressers among themselves, conspired among themselves, said, this is the heir, let us kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. So they took him, they cast him out of the vineyard, they killed him, Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He didn't give them a chance to answer. This is powerful. This is an incredible indictment against them. He says the owner sent his servants. The servants symbolized the prophets. And of old, God had sent the prophets to the nation. And Israel historically had rejected their prophets. They would stone their prophets. They killed some of their prophets. He says then finally he sends his son. He's speaking of himself. And they are to respect the son, revere the son, and accept the son, but instead they kill the son. So Jesus is prophesying about what they're getting ready to do in just a couple of days. They're going to conspire him, and they're going to kill him, and they're going to think that by eliminating the son, they get the vine vineyard, and they get the wine press, and they get their inheritance. And the owner ha now has no option but to deal with them on their terms because they will own the vineyard. And they will own the wine press. And then Jesus asks the question, what will that owner do to them? Before they can answer, he says he's going to come and he's going to judge them. So Jesus now is prophesying of the doom and the destruction that is going to come to that generation of Jews and Jewish religious leaders, which occurred in 70 A.D., when the Romans came in and they leveled Jerusalem, they tore the whole city down. And there hadn't been a, a Jewish temple since. And there hadn't been Jewish worship since. And basically the Jewish people became the scattered people, scattered into the four corners of the world with no national identity from 70 A.D. until 1948. From 70 A.D. until 1948, they had no nation, they had no homeland. Jerusalem was controlled by Gentiles. 
And it wasn't until 1948, after World War II, and after Hitler's Holocaust slaughter of six million Jews, and the Jews now have scattered to leave Germany, where many had settled, that the United States comes in with the United Nations, and they partition off, and they create a space in the land that we now know as Israel, but it wasn't called Israel then because the Romans changed the name and they called it Palestine. And that's why it's called Palestine in this day. And the United States partitioned the place off in Israel for the Jewish people to live. And they started the migration back in 48 from all over the world. The only place they could go back to was the United States of America, which many came here and others went to settle in Israel in 48. But the Arab nations and the Islamic nations around them say they will not control Israel. We will drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. And they've attempted to do it ever since. And in 1966, a group of Arab nations come against them to try to drive them into the Mediterranean and drive them out of Israel. And one of the most miraculous military feats in history a ragtag bunch of Jewish soldiers was able to not only defend their place, but they took control of Jerusalem. They hadn't had control of Jerusalem since 70 AD. They take it back in 1996 and they lift the sick pointed flag of David and they said that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. So since 1966, there's been constant skirmish and fighting in Jerusalem and all this fight about the West Banks and who's going to control Jordan, it all goes back to this. And the Jews say, we will not give up Jerusalem. And we don't care what the United States of America says. And we're not going to make with certain concessions because we don't have nowhere else to go. This is all what Jesus was prophesying. You're not going to have anywhere to go. You're going to be crushed. And it won't be until the Messiah is is preparing to return that you will get back into the land. And so that's why us, those of us who believe the Bible and believe in biblical prophecy, that's why we're so excited. We know that God is in control because if you look at it historically, there is no historical reason, no military reason as to why the Jews would ever get back in Israel and no reason they would ever take the Jerusalem back when the Arabs and the Muslims had the most powerful armies in that part of the world. But now they do control it. And Jews are returning back to Israel. And they're fortifying themselves. And they're preparing for the big war that they know that's going to come. And they're preparing for a preemptive strike against Iran if they have to do it. Listen closely, ladies and gentlemen, when Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister of the United States of America, and this breach between he and President Obama, Netanyahu said to the whole world, we don't wait on nobody to defend us. We don't depend on anybody to defend us. And what they, he was sending in the record is, we're not going to get no clearance from the United States of America before we do a preemptive strike if we think our national security is in jeopardy. And they were sending a signal now, we have come of age. We got the big weapons too, because we gave them to them. Okay, everything that we have in our military arsenal, everything the United States has in the military arsenal, Israel has. They just don't have it as in large a quantity, but we have made sure that they have been equipped with nuclear bombs and hydrogen bombs and all these fighter planes that we have, and then they take it and they kind of increase it in terms because they're technological genius and wizardry, and so they fine tune and calibrate it so some of their stuff is better than the stuff that we have that we created. Now the reason I'm sharing all this is because this is important. We are at this point in history where the Gentile nations have surrounded Israel and are threatening to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea and almost every single day there is a major skirmish. We know we got the Syrian conflict, we have Hezbollah, we got all these groups and it's all about them trying to destroy Israel. So Jesus prophesied in 30, 32 AD, I mean, that this was going to happen. All right? Now let me move quickly. I didn't, Took too much time. I got off on this uh, chasing this prophetic rabbit. These prophetic rabbits, they will take you all over the place. You see, if you're not disciplined, so I wasn't disciplined this morning. All right, so that's the backdrop. He prophesies against them. You don't understand. To do this to these powerful theologians, the spiritual brain trust, and to embarrass them in public like this was more than they could take. 
And Jesus in verse 11, he says, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief corner stone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in your eyes. Look at verse 12. You think I'm making this up. And they sought to lay hold of him. They sought to strangle him right there on the spot. They were ballistic. They were incensed. But his popularity was still so great. He had just come into Jerusalem a few days earlier. Hail, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Because they thought he was coming in to throw off the Roman government. So his popularity is at its peak. So they fear the people because of this. Look what it says. For they knew he had spoken the parable against them. They knew that it was a condemnation against them, against their religious system, against their hypocrisy, against their greed, against their pride and their arrogance, and against their apostasy that they no longer truly represented God, nor that they represent accurately what God's word taught. Now, what you find in any religion, money is always right there lurking beneath the surface somewhere. Because religion is already always potentially incredibly profitable for those who can control it and manipulate the masses of people. And we see it in our day and time. One of the great, there, there are three great wealth transfers taking place in America today. One of them is the wealth transfer of money from poor people in inner city neighborhoods and now all over the world has been transferred through the rap music industry. Back up this system because it's so sophisticated. They come up not only with the music, they got the clothes, they got the genre, they got the jury and all this. So the amount of money that's going in that, that industry, a huge transfer of wealth out of neighborhoods and out of communities. One of the second great wealth transfers that's taking place it's a wealth transfer that is going into the spiritual industrial complex. How we have turned religion into an industry. And we have these Pied Pipers on television that was preached for 15 minutes and then take 15 minutes to sell you the tapes, the books, to get you to take the cruise, to get you to become a partner, and put it all on your credit card. Put it all on your credit card. And so we've got wealth transfer taking place out of local communities and local neighborhoods where people are not supporting their own local church, but they're sending their money through the mail to someone else who's living a plush, lavish lifestyle that's building an incredible industry to buy all this airtime on the radio and the television. You better put your money where your mama and your grandmama and your daddy are going to be eulogized. You better invest your money where your children are going to be married. You better invest your money where there are people that will come to you in the hospital when you are sick to make sure they have bathed your bottom and bought you something to eat. I tell young people all the time, they think I'm half crazy. I say, you'll stop by the church. You'll come see me. And I say, well, if you don't want to come see me, you ought to come and drop off an offering. Be so that we can have lights and heat and water and gas when we got to do your funeral. Amen. Or do the funeral for your mother. Or your, and I ain't mad at you, nothing like that. I'm just trying to help you to understand that other people don't care whether or not they burn you up, whether they throw you in the Kanoa River or not. There are only a handful of folk, and most of them are in the churches, that want you to have a decent burial. I believe that everybody deserves a dignified funeral. I, I believe that. And, and those of you who know me, you know that. The number of funerals that we hold in this church, when won't no other church take the people's funeral. All the funeral homes got this number. Deacon Mitchell can tell you because he has to come in and clean the church up before they come and then clean the church up after they leave. We do all kind of funerals every single year because I believe that everybody deserves a decent, dignified funeral to show that people recognize as a human being their life really mattered and it really counts. And that's what the church has to always, always stand for. And so we have to have spiritual integrity, the way we do things, the way we treat people, and the issues we stand up for, and we always must be willing to stand up for what's right, even if we have to stand all by ourselves, because in the end, God is going to be standing up with us. I wrote an op-ed piece that they refused to publish for some period of time. They found it ran it yesterday. I was at home up in Mount Hope. I didn't see it till this morning. 
and the piece is about immigration reform. And here's the essence of it. There are 11 million people in this country illegally, 11 million. 40% of them came legally. They had a visa to come, the visa ran out, they said, I'm going to stay. Now they're here illegally. The other 60% came in illegally, violated the sovereign borders of the United States of America, and came in and made themselves at home. Now while they are here, most of them are industrious, hard-working people. And they came here to work because of the opportunities to work that the United States make available. And I said, you're welcome. And I'm a Christian, a real Christian. I believe Hebrews chapter 13. You entertain the stranger. Because some have entertained angels and didn't know it. I'm all for immigration reform. We need to immigrate. We need to reform the immigration system. We got to secure the borders, and the 11 million people that are here, they ain't going nowhere. As a matter of fact, if they weren't here, then we wouldn't eat a lot of stuff. They found it out in Alabama. Them small people in Alabama, y'all passed that law in Alabama, y'all gonna run all of the immigrants out. And what ended up happening is, most of the fruit and vegetables was rotting on the vine because they couldn't find poor people in Alabama willing to go out and work in that hot sun to harvest the fruits and the vegetables. And many of the Hispanics, they left. Y'all don't want us? We're going to go to the next city. So they harvest the migrant workers. We would not have fresh fruits and vegetables if it wasn't for the migrant workers. Many of them are immigrants, and many of them are here illegally. We need it. I believe we need a pathway to citizenship. We need a pathway to say, if people are going to be here, I want them paying taxes like everybody else. I want them on the books legally like everybody else. I want them to pull their weight like everybody else. But many of these people who have come here with good intention, but while here, they committed crimes. Not bad crimes, not violent crimes. They committed fraud. They've taken money from the government illegally, not being an American citizen. They got money. If you do that, you're going into the federal court system and you're going to federal penitentiary. But we're going to let this pass. So here's my point. Everyone has been convicted of a crime in the United States of America. They go to penitentiary. They do their time in penitentiary that the court system during their period said they do. Then they get released, but they got a lifetime sentence hanging over their head. If they are a convicted felon, they now can be legally discriminated against. All the civil rights laws don't apply to them. They can be legally discriminated against for employment. They can be legally discriminated against for housing. If they have a federal crime, they can't get workforce job training through the system. They can't get a Pell Grant to go to college. They can't get a barber's license unless they go through a whole rigmarole. It doesn't mean it, even if they had no violence in their past, they can no longer, they can never own a firearm or possess a firearm, so they no longer have a Second Amendment right. In uh, several states, they can no longer vote, ever. Now, most states, once they discharge their time, they can get the right back to vote. Now, what kind of society are we creating here? We're creating a society of two types of citizenship. Full citizenship for those who haven't been to prison, Partial citizenship for those who have been in prison. I don't know if that's the type of country we want to live in. But we're going to create a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million that are here illegally. I'm only suggesting is there should be a pathway to citizenship for everybody who's released from prison. They should put it on the road to get their citizenship back. That only makes sense. We're creating a permanent underclass. And these people cannot provide for their children. And I'm not saying you got to invite them to dinner tomorrow, but I'm saying once we release them, we put them on a pathway for some, it might be two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, I don't know, but put them on the pathway. Because with immigration reform, they're talking about maybe 10 to 15 years. Uh, but you got to prove yourself again. Now, this might sound like, what are you talking about this? Because we live with these decisions. And we're living in neighborhoods and communities with people that have been released from prison every day. As a matter of fact, the greatest concentration of ex-offenders in both the state and federal system released in West Virginia, they come back to Kenora County, a disproportionate to Charleston, and the, most, the highest group to the west side of Charleston. They're here among us. So it's in our best of interest to try to see if they're on some pathway to responsible living. That's what it means to stand for what's right. 
even when it's not popular. The church has to be standing up for what's fair, what's right, and what's just, and we have to always be pleading the case for the least, the last, the left out, and the left behind, because the other groups will have political lobbyists that buy their influence into the political system. So there has to be an independent clarion voice that says, no, we're for what's right. That's what Jesus was. Jesus is not what we thought he was. He was a militant radical when it came to pleading the case for those people that were being exploited and taken advantage of by the Jewish religious system. And that is why the leaders hated him so much because the common folk were following him and following his teaching and they realized he has a movement so great they'll be able to overthrow our clandestine plan as they can see things more clearly. Well, I'm just about out of my time, so I'm going to wrap this up fairly quickly. So it's all about authority. And so Jesus acted as if he had authority, because he did have it, and authority was for his, from his father. So just quickly, I want to hit this tax thing, because they're trying to trip him up, you know? They're trying to trip him up. I mean, some things never change, and history has a way of being cyclical. Most societies, when they wanted to go after somebody, they used the tax system to go after them. I find it ironic that here in 2013, we have this great scandal in Washington, D.C. regarding the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service has been accused of, and it appears to be, it's not merely an accusation, it be a fact, that some of the Internal Revenue Service were targeting some of these conservatives of uh, political groups for special scrutiny around their tax status. That's illegal, unfair, and unjust. And they shouldn't have been doing that. It's illegal, it's unfair, and it's unjust. But didn't nobody say anything back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s when the IRS was targeting any black leader who dared to say that civil rights needs to happen now, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Megan Edwards, all of them were targeted by the IRS. One after all of them. I had carte blanche authority to go after them. They couldn't get them on some legal, get them on some form they didn't fill out, and nobody said a word. No, nobody said a mumbling word. Now the IRS is going after powerful folk because the political stakes are so high. Who's going to have the authority to run the government and divvy up the public treasury? Don't you know what politics is? Politics is nothing but war without bloodshed. That's all. It's war. And war is war with bloodshed. But the people in politics are as aggressive and they are as motivated and ambitious as any five-star general. And this is about power because the politicians control the five-star generals. They control the military apparatus. And the economic, that's why the drama is so high, and that's why it doesn't care who gets in there, they're going to do something clandestine to try to take more control and have more power and have more authority over the political and the social apparatus. And this is not political talk, this is prophetic talk. When you understand, that's what you're dealing with. So they come up to Jesus with an IRS question. I'm not making it up. It's right there in the book. They come to Jesus with an IRS question, and they ask him the question. They say, we want to know. The Pharisees and the Herodians, these groups hated each other, and the Sadducees, they all hated each other. They were rivals for power, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. But they came together when it came to trying to eliminate Jesus. They said, look, a third of the pie, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, is better than none of the pie because he's going to take it all. So they asked him a question. They said, teacher, we know, verse 14, you don't really care about people. Now, they weren't saying it that way. They were saying, you don't show partiality. You have no regard for people's titles. We understand that. You preach the word of God in truth. Tell us a question. Is it lawful to pay your taxes or not? They tried to get him in trouble with Caesar. I told you, you could do what you want to do in Rome, but you better pay your taxes to Caesar. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? They're thinking Jesus is going to 
come with some great spiritual philosophical answer that God is the great God and the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and everything belongs to God, so give it all to God. Jesus said, give me a denarii, give me a coin. They gave him a coin. He said, Who's, whose picture is this? <laughs> they said, it's Caesar. That means Caesar made it, right? Pay your taxes. Give to Caesar what belongs to him. And give to God what belongs to him. And so what belongs to him is you and everything that you possess. Pay your taxes and then give everything else to God in terms of presenting yourself to God and making yourself available to God. They couldn't catch him, even with the IRS. He had to be God because the IRS can catch anybody. They even had Governor Mitt Romney running for cover. And Mike Romney is a straight-laced guy. You look at this guy's history, man. He's straight-laced. He's given millions of dollars to, to, to his church and so forth. But they had Romney a little bit 50 when the IRS started looking around trying to find something. The IRS couldn't even get it. And so the last conversation about authority has to do with marriage. See, we sometimes think that these guys, no, that they, you, you deal with the, the practical reality of what's really taking place, so taxes is pretty important, right? And now the marriage is important. So they come to Jesus with this great hypothetical situation. There's a guy, he had six brothers, it was seven of them, our Jewish custom is a man takes a wife and he dies and she doesn't bear him children. Then because of the land in Israel was tied to the male heir, therefore the brother, younger brother, would take the wife to try to bring forth a child. And they give this scenario, and they said at the end of the day, all seven brothers were married to the same woman. And all seven of them died without having produced children. And then they asked the most ridiculous question in the world. <laughs> and that was, in the resurrection, who's going to be married to her? Now, if all seven of them were married to her on earth, all seven of them died, why would they want to try it again? Why would they be fighting up in heaven among themselves as to who's going to have her in heaven? The question was a hype. Probolic situation, it was utterly ridiculous. I'm sure that them guys would be running from her like the plague in heaven if all seven of them died. But who gets her in the resurrection? Who gets her? Who's going to be married to this woman in the resurrection? And Jesus says, therein is your problem. He exposed them right here, and he also answers the question that they have been asking him, they just didn't get it, by what authority? He says, therein lies your question. He says, you are in great error. You've made a giant mistake. And what is your mistake? Your mistake is you don't know the scripture. And you don't know the power of God. The two essentials, right? The two essentials of being a truth teller and a truth bearer and a representative of God is to know the scripture and to believe in the power of God. He says, you don't know the scripture and you don't know the power of God. Your ignorance of the scripture is you do not understand that in the resurrection, there is no giving and taking in marriage. Marriage is not for heaven. Marriage is for the earth. Marriage is for human relationships on earth. So a man and a woman would have companionship so that they could bring children into the world and advance God's kingdom and nurture those children and then have each other for companionship as they grow old to be able to take care of each other and give each other medication and bring each other the bed pan. That's what marriage is for. It's for the earth. But in heaven, we don't need the bed pan. We don't need medication. And we don't need nobody cooking in us no fried eggs and no sausage and no potatoes that is soaking in grease to get us to heaven faster. No, it's not necessary. And he simply says this, you do err, you don't know the scripture, you don't know the power of God. For in heaven, he did not say they become angels. He said they are like the angels. They are like the angels. How will we be like the angels in heaven? When we get to heaven, we'll be like the angels in that we will have but one job and one relationship. Our one job is to worship God, to praise God, to honor God, and to serve God, and our one relationship will be with God. 
And that will be the most consuming thing for us, and we will not need relationships and fellowships and children and grandchildren. We will not need those familiar relationships in heaven because we will be in the presence of God, and the song then will be a reality. My God is more than enough. He would need all that we need. Oh, this was powerful. So he tells him where his authority comes from. He says, my authority, it comes from the scripture. And then he quotes the scripture and says, this is a marvelous thing. And you've missed the fact that God has placed in his word his authority for those who know God's word will continue in God's truth and they will know the truth and in the truth that will set them free. And once their minds are liberated, when they understand the truth, they're no longer held hostage by the world's appraisal and opinion and they can walk in the light of God's word knowing they are a disciple of Jesus Christ bringing to bear God's kingdom in time and in space. And it doesn't matter whether or not the majority agrees with us or not. It doesn't matter whether the majority agrees with us or not. We just live our lives, lives out with dignity and with grace and with elegance and with love. But when it comes to standing for the truth, we just stand for the truth. And as my grandmother used to say, come hell or high water, here is where we're going to stand. And we have authority. I'll share with you before, I'll share with you again. The only thing the powerful people fear is the truth. Amen. It's the truth. They will control the military. They will control the economics. They will control the political system. They will control the social apparatus. But the one thing they fear is the truth because it's only the truth that can expose them and expose their clandestine plans. And in a republic and in a totalitarian regime, it is only the fear that the masses are going to know what the truth is and know the game that they're being played on them 